Khensa, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your patience. We know we're running a little behind schedule, um, but with Zoom life, I think we've, we've all gotten used to waiting and just dealing with these random obstacles um, posed by technology. But I mean, it also allows us to be here. So we're grateful for your presence. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to your questions. We look forward to learning from our panelists and engaging with them. Um, before we proceed any further, we will have uh, Mr. Fareed from the U.S. Embassy's political economic section, who works on sustainability and consumption, to give us our opening remarks. Mr. Fareed, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Khamsa, for inviting me to deliver opening remarks. And thanks to our panelists and guests in the audience for joining us this evening for this timely dialogue. At this point in time, the world is at critical juncture as nations come together to establish measures to mitigate the threat of climate change. Human activity continue to generate significant levels of environmental degradation. The World uh, Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Report 2020 issued last September reported that since 1970, there has been 68% drop in the population of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles. We know that human activity is a significant driver of this precipitous drop in species population. Recognizing that our Earth's natural ecosystems provide essential resources such as food, water, fuel, plant pollination, medicines, protections from storms and floods, and basic services that make life possible, the U.S. State Department coordinates in a multilateral forum to conserve our planet's biodiversity, providing a foundation for healthy and resilient communities and economies, which in turn could promote stability and prosperity throughout the world. Turning now to our oceans, Consumption contributes to some 8 million tons of plastic pollution ending up in oceans every year. This jeopardizes marine ecosystems, navigational safety, natural resources, and economic health. In response, we are working to support countries in their efforts to establish environmentally sound waste management and encouraging sustainable approaches to plastic use and uh, disposal to counter the plastic pollution crisis. While animals and ecosystems face threats, humankind is not immune to harm. Air pollution is a large and growing global threat to human health with significant economic consequences. Nearly 7 million people die each year, about 10% of worldwide death. Because of air pollution, the Department of State is working with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to help partner governments around the world improve air quality for their citizens. Across the globe, climate change poses a growing threat to people's livelihoods and well-being. The climate crisis is endangering all of us and costing us more by the day. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to achieving a carbon pollution-free U.S. power sector by 2035, putting the United States on an irreversible path to a net zero emissions economy by 2050. This includes ensuring the U.S. federal government is using 100% renewable energy by 2035 and dramatically improving waste management and energy and water efficiency in our global operation. The United States recognizes that it produces 15% of the world's carbon pollution. This is a lot, I know, and we desperately need to reduce that number. We also need to work with countries around the world to reduce the other 85%. The United States is therefore moving swiftly to join hands with the international community to tackle this crisis. We have re-entered the Paris Climate Accord and appointed a presidential special envoy for climate, John Kerry. Special envoy Kerry just completed a visit to the United Arab Emirates to participate in the regional dialogue conference on climate change. 
where he joined Qatari and other regional leaders in signing a joint statement urging global powers to stick to Paris Agreement commitments. In the coming weeks, the United States will convene some of the world's major economies to raise the ambition of all nations, including our own, to rapidly lower global carbon emissions. But tonight's discussion is not only about recognizing the growing threat around us. It's also a platform for us to discuss ways in which we can respond to improve the situation and our future. Here in Qatar, efforts like the Carbon Neutral World Cup are critically important because they act as specific windows of opportunity to act locally, yet with global impact. From sustainable construction and renewable energy to waste management and cleaner transport, there are clear openings for the United States and Qatar to deepen bilateral cooperation to achieve the goal of a carbon neutral World Cup. Qatar and the United States are also exploring platforms for enhanced cooperation on topics of mutual concern, including environmental health and the application of artificial intelligence in civil and environmental engineering. As we embark on our work, above all, we must hold ourselves accountable to an overarching measure of success. Are we delivering results for our families, our communities, our countries, and our planet? Earth Day 2021 will take place on Thursday, April 22nd. This year's theme is Restore Our Earth. I hope each of us will leave this event today knowing how to take action and change our habits to slow the pace of environmental degradation and to restore our earth for everyone. Thank you again for inviting me to speak this evening, and I wish the panel a productive discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very articulate contextualization. You've raised some very important issues, and I look forward to listening to our panelists and what they have to say about this. Without further ado, let's begin to introducing the stars of this show, our panelists. Our first panelist for today is Dr. Maumer. Dr. Maumer is the founding professor and head of the Division of Sustainable Development at HPKU and Qatar Foundation. Our second panelist for today is Ms. Catherine Bath. Ms. Barth is the um, president of Sustainable Qatar. Our third panelist for today is Dr. Saeed Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed is the director of knowledge policy at uh, Arab Youth Cli uh, Climate Movement. Thank you for joining us. Before we proceed any further, let's hear from our panelists about how they began to think about issues of sustainability and why they feel like this is their passion. Why do they work for consumption? Why do they work for sustainability? And why should it be something we all think about? Um, so without further ado, Dr. Mommer, could you please tell us your perspective of how your journey began? Why are you interested in sustainability? and um, what did you learn from your journey? Good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to greet everyone and also thank the organizers for inviting us and organizing this session to share our thoughts with everyone else. Uh, for me, uh, I came across and I started feeling the need for sustainability when I was a young engineer in an automotive company in the US, in the Midwest. Uh, I was responsible for designing uh, for parts for SUVs. And uh, in my second year in this company, it was a great company. We were doing great products, but I realized that I was contributing to something unsustainable by making these big cars instead of working in a company that would make and that would spend their time and efforts and money in smaller or lightweight or electric cars. And uh, believe it or not, in, without starting my third year, I left the company and joined the university. Uh, that was the first time that I felt uh, guilty a little bit about what I was doing. And when I was in the university, I started 
mostly working on design and manufacturing of uh, for lightweighting, lightweighting cars, other vehicles, as well as any other products that we had. And uh, that gave me a very good feeling. And I was really uh, into my research, into my teaching, because I believe that whatever I was doing my, for my research or teaching, it was also contributing positively to the society, to the future. And I was very uh, lucky and grateful that I later on came across other research topics uh, on clean energy, renewable energies like hydrogen. Uh, I started working on the hydrogen economy, hydrogen technology through fuel cell manufacturing and design in 2005. That was an addition into my ongoing research for lightweighting. Years later, I started learning more and involving more about other aspects of sustainability. I learned that sustainability is not only about the products, about the cars or lightweighting or clean energy, but it was mainly, I still believe, it, it was about what we do and what we don't as human beings, our behavior, our habits. And I started then working on this type of research, demand side management, social behavioral change in 2010s. So when I got this offer from the Hamad bin Khalifa University in 2014 to establish and launch a sustainable development division, a PhD program, it was a dream for me because years later I was able to, it was a blessing for me to put together what I all learned and what I all believed in into a PhD program that would generate many other people, many other scientists who would have the same and hopefully even better and stronger thinking about sustainability. This is in a nutshell, my journey and my experience with sustainability. Thank you. Wow, thank you for describing your journey. Um, I think what I realized is that this is our responsibility. And on an individual level, we can combine our passion for development and um, for whatever we want to investigate, but, but then also consider our social responsibility, be sustainable about it, and be cognizant about what we decide to do and why we decide to do it. Our next panelist also has a very inspiring journey from what I know of her and I've heard and I've read. So I'm really excited for you, our audience, to listen to her journey, to engage with her. Mrs. Barth, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for coming and sticking with us. I tried to make it short. Um, one of the things that um, you know stuck with me is I was born and raised in former East Germany. And so with the limited resources that we have, had um, we always had to invent things to make things work and that particular mindset um, to use your imagination your creativity and resource efficiency is really what shapes me to the day and uh, professionally my heart beats at the intersection of innovation entrepreneurship and uh, sustainability to to drive exponential change and you know, the interest in sustainability is also, um, I am also an um, engineer, so I started out my career as a civil and environmental engineer, and uh, because I like to combine the functional aspect of engineering with the uh, beauty of landscape in design or of, with, with the just beauty in, in design. And, and so I tried to make things work together because it just made sense to me. Um, you know, in fact, to, it is common sense if you can use, for instance, landscape as the infrastructure for water, you can reduce um, construction costs, capital costs, uh, maintenance costs, all of those kinds of things while increasing resilience of an urban area, for instance, right? And, uh, and so when um, when you when you look at um, the current model of capitalism, how our global economy works, you really know and it is no denial, I suppose, that we are really not in good shape and that without fundamental systemic changes, um, we will come off the rail, right? Everything is going to really collapse because 
we are in this profoundly new market shift, uh, which is catalyzed by rare unpredicted events. Some people call it black swans um, and COVID is just one part of it right now. And uh, we have only two options. Either we go towards a um, regenerative kind of like way of, uh, of working in our global economy uh, with wildly ambitious green transformation of uh, sustained wealth creation, or we go in complete doom. And as an eternal optimist, I think uh, we're going to take the route of, uh, of uh, regenerative capitalism. Um, but we have to act fast, right? So the National Oceanic and uh, um, uh, Atmospheric Agency, NOAA, just posted that our current levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, 412 uh, parts per million, and uh, and and with that, we really have to get on um, on a whole different change. We have to change everything, and we have to change things fast to to get moving. And and I believe we can do it because there's a lot of things that's happening that is super exciting. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. And you know, our next panelist is even more interesting at this point because you just said we have. To start working. And as an optimist, uh, I'd like to think I'm one as well. It's we, We'd like to think that there is something we can do and there is some change that we can effect so that we don't have to deal with the disastrous impact of climate change even more than we are right now. So Dr. Zaid, you deal with the climate change movement. You've started this in the Arab world. You deal with knowledge, but also you, you deal with policy. Can you tell us a little about your experience? How do you create this movement? How do you sustain this movement? How did you become a part of this movement? And where do you see it going from here? Um, thank you very much. I guess we are three engineers on the panel here. That's good to know. Uh, well, I, I graduated as a mechanical engineer back in 2007, and uh, I moved to Doha. And uh, oh, I come from a very small town in India where we are kind of bugged by so many environmental issues that we are facing. And, uh, and when I moved to Doha, I had a kind of a good uh, privilege of working at Qatar Foundation. And it opened up a lot of opportunities for me to interact with so many different uh, disciplines. And I started to uh, open my mind and look at what's happening uh, beyond my own field, like which I was working at the time on solar cells. And then eventually I moved out into more policy on social issues. And then I worked on, um, I worked as a radio jockey for QF Radio, where I tried to summarize all the major publications, particularly related to environmental issues, like the IPCC, UN reports, and all that was just coming out. My job is just to how to decode it, make it simplify and tell the world like what's really happening. And eventually, like I started being engaging myself like in research, like where I can integrate my activism plus research and to do something much more meaningful. And uh, then I was being very much engaged in COP18 summit that happened in Doha. And I started to realize that like how very important it is like, you know, to shape the conversation and to shift the discourse, uh, environmental discourse that we are currently in. And uh, much of the time, like, you know, we focus on very tangential issues and we need to really change the way we think and we perceive all the environmental issues that we are facing. And, uh, and I started an environmental NGO back home in India. Uh, and we try really hard to work on uh, topical issues that the uh, local community is facing, like with the farmers and uh, water scarcity and the, uh, the urban air pollution. There are so many things that we try to do our best, uh, but, but it is very difficult, particularly when you've been, uh, when you asked to change policy and especially where the vested interest is way too high. And at the same time, I started looking for opportunities to expand here in Qatar. And that's why uh, the COP18 summit has kind of a triggered that, you know, there is a kind of an independent organization is required in Qatar that we can uh, really uh, shift the environmental discourse. And that's the genesis of Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar. And uh, definitely it's very challenging because the civil society is not something very common in this part of the world. And, uh, and, and how to kind of uh, navigate ourselves in this difficult uh, uh, political system and the social system is itself a challenge. And we still figure out how we can best communicate ourselves, how we can uh, work with the policymakers. And we do work with the policymakers at large. And we try to, uh, we work on uh, writing policy briefings. We work at grassroots uh, programs, awareness programs. And this is something that uh, we have to see how we can make difference in the community. Um, 
you know, something that you mentioned, which sort of stuck with me was this idea of us not having a civil society uh, and yet needing to bring about grassroot level change. And I think that's what I've also seen happen in your own story where you realized that you had a certain responsibility and whether that was by observing in your country, like in India, or whether that was in your work in Qatar, you tried to effect change in whatever capacity that you possibly could. So for our audience and for me, can you tell us a little about what sustainable consumption means to you? Why is it important? And why does it matter for environmental protection? So we'll start with you, Dr. Maumer. Thank you again. Uh, very briefly, to me, sustainable consumption or responsible consumption is uh, the message that I have in my background. I just came across this uh, little note from the World Economic Forum. Uh, everything we use has a cost, not only a financial cost, the money that we pay, but it has an environmental cost. It's, it has a social cost, probably not on us directly, but definitely for our children. So responsible consumption to me briefly is not to start consuming. I know it is very difficult today in the modern life, but before we buy anything, we need to ask this question at least three times. Why do I need this? And justify it three times, and if it can be justified three times, then we should buy it. Otherwise, I am sure we can eliminate most of our consumption from the very beginning by refusing to buy anything. And that will be the start of the sustainable consumption. Otherwise, once we buy something and start using it or consuming it, its sustainability or the responsible aspect of it becomes less and less. And at the very end, as you can see again from the message behind me, even for a simple t-shirt, we consume close to 3000 liters of water. And this number here is true because we have also came up, came up with the similar numbers in our life cycle assessment analysis. And once we have it, then it starts adding cost, social and environmental cost uh, for all of us over and over, every time it stays in the, uh, in the use. Thank you. You know, I think that's such an important message because we, we think about costs and we think about costs in terms of the money that we spend or the time that we spend, which is important, but we don't think about the water that is being spent while we buy our dresses or while we, you know, get fast food or any of those things. So um, thank you for that reminder and thank you for bringing this to our attention again, because it is certainly a very important part of our life and we need to think about it in every step that we take. Um, before we uh, move any further, you know, we heard earlier about the fact that Earth Day is coming up and certainly this conversation is happening right now, uh, partly because we are trying to celebrate Earth Day and partly because we're trying to understand how our patterns of consumption shape the Earth and what, what impact does it have for our future. Um, Mrs. Barth, can you tell us a little about the significance of Earth Day? What does it mean? Why should it matter to us? And what can we do about it? Um, well, so uh, simp simply put, um, Earth Day, which started in the US in uh, 1970, um, Earth Day transformed environmental activism into political actions, right, into enforceable legislation. And I think this was the first time really when um, it was realized that the individual person, the individual um, um, has actual power so that by demonstrating of 20 million people in US cities um, across the whole, um, the whole US, um, this action um, was um, that the United States government um, initiated the US Environmental um, Protection Agency, right? So the US Environmental Protection Agency is an outcome of individual consumers actually like us action to um, move things forward and um, 
And so the reason why I think it is so significant is because lots of people um, think that they are powerless um, against um, climate change and everything. And so there is actually a lot of things that we can do. Um, a couple of years ago on Al Jazeera, I listened to a program that was called Is Environmental Damage a Crime Against Humanity? And uh, it stuck me in the tracks because um, because you think of, um, of sustainability and um, everything connected to environmental, but is it actually a crime? And clearly with uh, um, what um, Farid in, in his opening remarks mentioned, the decline in biodiversity and everything, the increased um, um, cancer rates that we see is the direct impact of the toxins in our environment on our personal and planetary health. Um, and so there is one group right now, um, Stop Ecocide International. It's an organization that actually advocates to use criminal law instead of environmental law against polluters. Uh, to criminalize the damage to nature and uh, bring the offenders in front of the International Criminal Court in The Hague because they threaten our survival. And again, that is part of what our current economic model is based on. I mean, it's based on um, a capitalism that really destroys the very basis of our uh, foundation, which is the planet, and therefore uh, there is important um, ways to act for us. And uh, I, I save maybe a few comments for later, what individuals can actually do, but we do have power and we do need to get into action soon. Thank you. Wow, um, this idea of thinking of climate harm and um, in a, with the lens of you know criminal law is fascinating for me because you know we don't give things like the climate movement as much important as we really should. And the fact that it is in some instances thought of as a crime really appeals to me because it shows that we take what is happening very seriously and we take the fact that we can play a role very seriously. Um, so can we talk to our next panelist, Dr. Saeed, can you tell us a little about what we can do to become more uh, aware of the current situation? How can we become more sustainable consumers? How can we protect the environment while consuming? We know about the harm that we've done, but how can we do to, what, what can we do to make our consumption better, so to say? Uh, I guess like that's the kind of a question that we all been asking, like, you know, it's a very philosophical question. And also the way that our economies are set up is, uh, is we kind of consume and the only way is to grow is to consume as much as we can. And also like our appetite for consumption is never ending. Like, you know, we have been constantly being bombarded with so many advertisements and also like, you know, our social class says that like, you know, this is what you need to consume in order to stay relevant in the society. And, uh, and, and particularly in that kind of uh, major social and cultural forces, like if you've been trying to reduce your consumption, like you always remain as an outsider. And particularly like, you know, I always remain as an outsider. I never been part of the mainstream and you remain a radical in that sense. And it's very difficult, but that the, the counter current, the counter culture is kind of an emerging trend. Like, you know, particularly there are movements across the world and uh, particularly it started with this kind of hippie movement in the 1970s in the US. Uh, like in terms of now it has become more like an official mainstream moments. I just like to particularly point out two particular moments that has been really, really helpful. Uh, one is called Transition Towns, which has started in the year 2005, like where a group of community members are coming together and trying to kind of uh, localizing everything. Like, you know, because we live in the age of hyper globalization, everything has been highly commodified, which has been transported across the world, like even for like you know, a cup of yogurt uh, goes from one part of the world to another end. And like for Qatar, particularly, we depend so much on imports and you can see like where your each product comes from. And so this transition towns was just trying to combat this globalization and how you kind of create communities that are kind of locally relevant and you create products and services that depends on within the local community. We know exactly what kind of damages that we are creating. And that's one of the problem with the waste is that like, you know, we have distance ourselves the waste that we create. Earlier, like in the past, like, you know, we always depend within the local community, but now we always, we, with this globalization process, we buy everything that's been 
thousands of kilometers away from us. Like, you know, we get our avocado, like, you know, from Chile or uh, other places, and we don't really know what is the process. Like, you know, we, the, the waste has been kind of hidden from our side. So this distancing of waste is a big problem. And also like, we don't realize like, you know, our consumption creates conflict. You know, this is something in a overlooked factor that we don't really see. Like the most common uh, product that we use our mobile phones has a blood in a mobiles. And particularly we use this, all this uh, precious metals that's been mined in Congo and other uh, conflict zones. And all this comes with uh, some sort of social and environmental cost. And in some places it's much higher than uh, in other. And also the, the idea of like extreme commodification. Now everything has been so commodified, like you know, even our services, our basic interpersonal relationships has been commodified. In this, in this age of like, you know, high commoditization, how are we going to kind of come out of that zone? It's really, really impossible. I'll just give you one particular, two particular examples on that one. So uh, you, you, you take this basic examples of the children's play. You know, nowadays, like we rely on this Barbie dolls, like, you know, with the action figures and the package entertainment. And this is what, like, you know, we really need it, like in order to entertain our children. Like in the past, like we always depend on this handicrafts, live entertainment, like, you know, we need to play with the natural surroundings. And similarly with our food that we, the production that we grow, we always need this commercial fertilizers, pesticides, engineering seeds. But in the past, the food production is mostly requires a local, uh, like a profound knowledge of the soil, of a local environment and reuse of materials, whatever we depend on that one. And we tend the soil based on like how that soil in that particular environment is. I guess in, in this uh, era of globalization, hyper commodification, it is really difficult, you know, to get out of it. But these kind of counter currents uh, that's coming up and uh, which picking up with the force, with the policies, and we see that that a trend is slowly changing, but it's a, still a long way to go. But the only problem is that we have very little time. And you're talking about like reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 or 2040, if you really wanted to maintain the temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius below. And for that one, we really need to accelerate these kind of movements and also to kind of challenge the dominant um, uh, patterns of economic and trade and exchange. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've spoken so much about high, this, this sort of capitalist model of consumption that we're all falling prey to in one sense or the other. Um, can we hear a little from Dr. Marmer about how we can convince entrepreneurs to become more sustainable? Um, perhaps through that, we can sort of get rid, and I know this is perhaps me being an optimist, again, how we can get rid of these capitalist ideals that shape our patterns of consumption, or if not get rid of them, perhaps establish some something that brings about a grassroots change within our capitalist structure? Uh, it's a very good question. And I believe, uh, I truly believe that everything starts from uh, uh, how we shape the next generation of entrepreneurs so that we can achieve a truly sustainable development. As we all know, sustainable development stands on three main pillars, social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Uh, but still, we also are aware of the fact that economics still run the business, unfortunately. And when we examine the economics, it is in fact, not economic capitalism, it is nowadays, maybe during the past uh, 100 years, it has been the financial capitalism. So entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship in a way, they embody two main drivers of sustainability. The financial sustainability and human capital sustainability. So if we can train the entrepreneurs as human beings, as the human capital, who are aware of the sustainability issues and who care about the health of the planet, health of the society. And if we can also train them or convince them that they will only go with the sustainable financing, then I think we can shape the next uh, generation and uh, shape the next uh, decades uh, towards better and more sustainability. So innovation for sustainability kind of topics 
and uh, can be taught in the universities, even down to K-12, to give this kind of an understanding to the young people that would help uh, to obtain and to achieve the uh, human capital with the sustainability in mind. But when it comes to having the financial sustainability or sustainable financing, then it goes beyond the entrepreneurs. In fact, it goes to the investors. It goes to the in institutional investors that they should put the sustainability as number one criteria when they are investing. I think without achieving this, without enforcing or achieving institutional financiers to put the sustainability as number one criteria in their decisions, it will be really difficult to achieve the truly sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, institutional change is very important, but we also have to consider intersectional dimensions of what it means to create movements that you know, make our institutional uh, institutions more sustainable and make our entrepreneurs and everyone else who's a part of the society, a part of this movement also. Uh, Mrs. Barth, can you chime in? Can you give us your perspective on this? Um, how can we perhaps, firstly, improve this, but also secondly, um, make women a part of this movement or perhaps talk about some of the challenges you faced but also generally how we can make this movement of sustainability more inclusive um i think there have been some uh, really important points um listed already uh, the thing is i mean i have to say i i um as i said i grew up with very limited resources and i'm really grateful to my parents who taught me to find my purpose to be happy with little and that being frugal is actually a superpower right and and so and that has stayed with me um, for a long time and and i think when we address the regular uh, normal individual person in terms of consumerism we can't just kind of like bash on um on everybody's uh, behavior because i think um our behavior is just um a symptom of of something else right and that is also this short-lived um pleasure rather than uh, long-lived um, happiness and and so when it comes to consumerism consumption i think maybe we should even define a few terms here first consumption is actually just um, satisfying a basic need for a human which is food clothes and uh, and all of that the the real problem is consumerism because that has turned into this social and economic order um, that has turned into obsession and it has been called a social disease um, you know and there is this uh, author um, Dave Ramsey who said we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like and I think that kind of like about sums it up um, and we also have to understand who we actually are doing this for it's not the planet who we need to save it's ourselves because the planet <laughs> the planet will just live on happily ever after once the humans are gone because that's what the earth has been doing for 3.8 billion years right i mean it's optimizing things that are great and it's getting rid of things that don't work out so well <laughs> and i think you know humans clearly have a design flaw there and uh, and so when it comes to consumption it's about doing things differently and, uh, and I think that's really the opportunity that we have as women, as men, as entrepreneurs, as innovators, um, to find different materials that don't come from this linear extractive design and uh, supply chain, but are actually made with material that are degradable, that can be used again, that is um, edible, um, all of those kinds of things, right? So it's about being conscious about our choices, is to prioritize, is to ask questions, is to know what actually is in our food, what is in our clothing, what's in our cleaning supplies, what are we eating, what are we breathing, what are we coming in contact with that actually then has an impact on our personal health. And so I think that is exactly where our personal power lies. And, um, and, and so um, 
I don't know, um, Mohammed, you might, uh, Zaid, you might want to talk about um, Annie Leonard, um, the story of stuff, which is, uh, well, any of our, our listeners can maybe look it up. It's a short video. It's, um, uh, it's a way of understanding how things are actually working. So if we are tricked into buying things, um, whether we like them or not, um, again, maybe just an outcome, but if things are made from um, edible material, and it might not be us eating our stinky um, or worn out sneakers, but maybe some bacteria and, and somebody else that is not being poisoned by the material of those sneakers, then consumption isn't really a problem, right? Because if it's staying within the circular economy, then it is something that um, is not a problem because it actually just recycles itself like uh, the, um, the earth has done um, forever. And so, you know, when it comes to, again, women or men, um, I don't really see the, the gender difference there. One of the biggest opportunities I think I have as a mom and um, as a wife is to really change language. And, and um, because there is the stereotypical characteristics assigned to male and female, you know, whereas um, strong, powerful, assertive leadership uh, skills translate into something very derogative for women. Um, we as women have actually, uh, and moms, mothers, um, aunts, sisters, we, we have a choice to change that narrative. And I think that really is um, also very powerful to learn um, how we can use language, uh, neural language linguistically in, in terms of really finding something else. And, um, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to sustainable Qatar, for instance, um, one of our um, things that we have contributed or tried to do is to create those 52 weekly challenges um, that are themed around things that we really come in contact with on a daily basis in our daily lives that we have control over, which we then have a powerful way of acting against. So, you know, if we don't want toxins in our um, food and in our cleaning material, then we should not buy that. And, and I think that is the most important part for us to, to play a role personally and in business as well. Um, well, you've definitely made me question a lot of what I believe in, but also you've successfully appealed to my self-preservation instinct. Um, so, you know, the idea is that we work towards climate, for climate change and for sustainable consumption, not because we're being altruistic and trying to save the earth, but just because we're trying to save ourselves. And it's, you know, it starts from as something as simple as you questioning yourself, the language that you use and the ideals that you uphold. So I think I've gotten a lot to think about after. Um, Dr. Said, would you like to contribute to this? Um, where, where do you see Qatar headed as a state? Where do you think these sustainable uh, policies are headed? Uh, where is the future going as far as the state is concerned? Um, things are in motion. Uh, that's a good thing about it. And there, is, um, uh, there are a lot of interesting developments has happened. I particularly, I recently finished a study about Qatar's uh, revised emission inventory. And uh, also I did a whole a comprehensive study about Qatar's consumption-based emission inventory from 98 to 2019. I'll just pick out some of the findings, like you know what I find out. And um, the interesting thing is Qatar has reduced nearly 8.5 million tons of greenhouse gas emission from its peak in 2013 uh, compared to 2019. And most of the reductions came from LNG sector, particularly they've invested like over billion dollars to reduce flaring emissions. And that has really paid effort, uh, paid, uh, paid off. And they've reduced quite substantial emissions. And, and also like some other companies like petrochemical companies like Capco, Kafak, and all these companies have done an amazing job uh, really like in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and in terms of energy intensity and Qatar Steel as well. And Qatar Steel has done a phenomenal job. And the one good thing about Qatar is that most of these companies are brand new and they've just started in the last 15, 20 years. And so they had the advantage of like, you know, bringing some of the most advanced technologies into the country. And that helped to reduce greenhouse gas emissions already. And uh, now Qatar Petroleum has released a new report, a sustainability report a few weeks, a few months back, and which has kind of uh, put Qatar in a position that where it's going to reduce further greenhouse gas emissions, particularly focusing on uh, carbon sequestration. And um, they plan to reduce uh, like another five to 10 million uh, tons of CO2 emissions per year. 
And but it will be offset by like more LNG production that will which will come into force in uh, 2024 and 2026. And that's it to be seen, like I know how this trend will move forward. But from other non-energy sector, Qatar is like planning for zero waste Qatar, which was announced like last week by the Under Secretary in the Ministry of Environment. And uh, as we speak, the strategy is under uh, development, and we need to see how that will evolve. And currently, Qatar kind of converts almost 2,300 tons of um, waste, particularly the domestic waste, into electricity, which kind of contributes almost 50% of uh, total uh, electricity consumed by big hotels in Qatar. So they are planning to uh, scale up this uh, waste to energy conversion uh, to almost one million, like almost 5,000 tons of seaweed uh, waste per day. And it will be interesting to see uh, with the growing population and uh, how this will um, emerge. And the other good thing is that like the number of buildings like in Qatar that has been built in the last few years has uh, mostly GSA certified, like, you know, which is the uh, Doha based sustainability um, building metric. And they have started in 2009 and like nearly 1, 17,000 hectares of building area, built area has come under GSAS rankings. That's quite phenomenal, but we have to see how far these buildings has reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Very little has been studied and we really need to see. And uh, at the another study, the study that I mentioned that Qatar's consumption emission that we kind of constantly talk about Qatar has highest per capita emission. And what we try to do at AYCM Qatar is just try to understand like how much the production based and consumption based emission by looking at each and every sector and how much they contribute. And then we kind of come to an uh, answer that like you know, where Qatar's emissions from 40 tons, which is based on production to like 13 tons of CO2 emissions, which is kind of almost equivalent to most of the European cities and like you know, far less than North American and Australasian countries. And if you compare to the global average of consumption uh, cities of 40 big cities, they're like 10.7 tons. So Qatar is still higher than average of many cities. Uh, still a long, a long way to go, particularly in the electricity sector that Qatar really needs to work on. And they're planning to install solar power plants as well. And uh, definitely they could increase uh, given uh, the cost has come down significantly. Qatar could uh, increase the amount of solar intake and now they plan to have like um, electric vehicles, so particularly for buses. But again, the buses doesn't contribute much to the total transportation. Like it's just like you know overall 0.2 percent of the glo uh, total emissions in Qatar. It doesn't really make any difference unless like much of the transportation has been public transport rather than private transport in itself. That is absolutely fascinating. There is so much that the government is trying to do. Um, I have so many more questions and I was supposed to keep this panel discussion short. Clearly, I wasn't able to do that because I just got very curious. And I have so many more questions that I'd like to ask that I'd like to discuss. But before we end, I want to be mindful of our panelist time and the audience's time. I want to give the audience an opportunity to engage with our panelists, be able to ask some questions. Um, be able to talk to us about what you know what they want to know about and um so let's open the floor to questions and i'm mindful of the fact that we can't answer a lot of them uh, just in the interest of time but we will try to go through as many as possible um so the audience the floor is yours now engage with us send us your questions and we will do our best to have them addressed by our panelists Mrs. Seal, do we have any questions? Yes, so some of the questions that we got in the registration is, um, what is the best way to change the mentality and the mindset and culture with regard to uh, responsible consumption and environment protection? Um, that's a brilliant question. And I think all of our panelists uh, can perhaps chime in on that. Um, and I think it really carries forward from the conversation that we've been having. Um, Dr. Maumar, would you like to start? Okay, I can uh, make a contribution to this. Of course, it can take a long time, but uh, two things to summarize. Passively, we need to start, as I said at the very beginning, start thinking three times before we make a purchase and try to reduce our uh, purchasing so that we can reduce our consumption. This will be a passive action that we can start doing. And proactive uh, thing to do would be, we are all human beings. 
we are created with huge amount of intelligence and perseverance. And uh, we need to make use of this intelligence and the perseverance and the knowledge for one thing, innovation for sustainability. I am sure we can innovate so many different things and ways and processes and systems to become more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you and yes, absolutely. Um, so let's think about ways in which we can individually innovate. Um, Mrs. Barth. Um, I, I just, before I go there, I would like to connect to Moema's comment. Um, there is a fantastic book that's called Biomimicry, Innovations Inspired by Nature. It's a great read. It's uh, five different stories of uh, how things used to be done and how things should be done or could be done differently. And again, it's really about thinking differently. It's not kind of like less or more. It's like we need to completely find Find new models that make the old model obsolete, right? And uh, and I think one of the most important things really is to understand the impact. I mean, we are not talking about sustainable um, sustainable consumption or anything like this for the fun of it. I mean, really, our our human existence is at stake, and and I think that is something that a lot of people completely um, uh, miss on this on this whole discussion. So the um, awareness of uh, you know what is my impact on the environment and what is the environment's impact on me um, is really important. Um, um, and so the changes come about um, when when you when you know more, right? So I mean, one of the example where things have changed already is ocean plastic movement. I mean, it took about 15 years to get to the level that everybody now understands that. Um, marine mammals uh, and marine animals um, really uh, kind of like die because of their stomachs exploding from plastic inside. Uh, and somewhat disturbing movie, not really a Thursday night or Friday movie, Friday night movie would be a plastic ocean or um, sea, sea spiracy that just recently came out. There are documentaries that show all of those kinds of things, but it's also about to understand um, where we are already heading uh, about food, you know, what are we eating? What is in the food? Um, so this whole connection between food and our personal health. So the first motivation should be my personal health. You know, how how does it actually impact me? And if I understand how uh, those toxins in the food that I'm eating, um, that uh, from from the toxins that are in my in the chemicals that I clean my house with. Um, these are all endocrine disruptors. Um, these are chemicals that disrupt our hormones. Um, you know, the, they are in the food, they're in the packaging, they're in our cooking ware, they're everywhere in our households. And if we start ridding our households of toxins, um, we have an impact on our own health. Um, you know, we have, we see an increased infertility, we see an increased cancer uh, rate, we see increased uh, chronic diseases, which again are all part of that. So every single time anybody picks up a plastic bag, for instance, you know, you have, you make a choice of whether you want to be part of the solution or not. And, uh, and since we have been talking about innovation and entrepreneurship so much, I mean, I just want to say that that um, solving the sustainable development goals is a $12 trillion business opportunity. Nobody is talking about altruism. Um, we need to find solutions that actually um, you know, allow us to work with different material, again, that are biodegradable, that are made from nature, that uh, turn back into nature and, and don't poison us all along. So um, that is really the personal choices and options that we have that make us powerful, as I said before. Folks, let's put on our thinking caps, rethink our choices and make more conscious decisions for ourselves. And there is a business opportunity in there for all you entrepreneurs and engineers, um, sort of rethink about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And uh, let's hear from uh, Dr. Saeed and then um, take it forward, Dr. Saeed. I guess most of the things that have been said, I just like to say that like desires are hard to suppress. You know, it's not very easy for us to 
And uh, also the progress comes with the price. Like, you know, the more you progress, like what we call as, and it has its own price. I guess sometimes we just need to start questioning what progress means. You know, again, like, you know, this is a very philosophical question. Like, you know, is this what progress and is this what the well-being, how you define well-being and how you define growth? And like, you know, these are the very fundamental questions that we need to ask. But one simple question that I uh, is to just talk to your own elders, like how they lived with less and, you know, and what kind of life they lived with. And this kind of profligate consumption just happened in the last two, three generations. Like in the past, like we never, we always kind of depended on very local resources. We always depend on a local uh, communities, like, you know, to supply products and services that we really need. And we need to really think about it. And also, and particularly, I'll just focus about on the mobile phones and look at the conflict that it will create it. And so there are so many other products and services that we use on a daily basis that has this kind of uh, long, uh, it, it casts a long sh shadow in communities that we don't really see. They're out of sight and their plight is completely hidden from our, our views. You just need to kind of like, you know, start peering away the things and see like what's hidden there. And just like, you know, the, the we started to kind of empathize with the animals that was bursting out with plastics, like Catherine said. So we really need to start to see the people and like, you know, who are being part of the supply value chain, like, you know, who are being affected in creating the products and commodities just to fulfill uh, a few moments of pleasure for you. You've left us with some very thoughtful questions. Uh, with that, we come to an end uh, for this panel discussion. I wish we could continue it and we'll definitely host more discussions like this and also try to get these distinguished panelists back again with us to discuss this further. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's a lot that I'm thinking about. There's a lot that I'm questioning about my own choices um, and what I want to do. So um, thank you for that very thoughtful and thought provoking discussion. Um, thank you for our audience's presence. And we hope that you enjoyed this discussion. Uh, please remember to follow our Facebook page because the US Embassy's Facebook page has uh, more information, other panel discussions, and uh, hopefully more information on future conversations like this that you can become a part of. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Hansa, for arranging this. Thank you. Thank you, and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye now.